we should be cautious about some conditions that appear like biliary atresia, but they are really not. One is allegedly syndrome, which has ductal hypoplasia. And you know that those allegedly who have had a Kasai porterostomy done, survival are lower, according to a recent meta analysis. Sclerosing cholangitis, HNF1 beta mutation, cystic fibrosis with a small gallbladder. And in the West, they all look at alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is uh, not routinely tested in India. We don't know whether it really exists, but most likely it does not, can't be sure. This is not moving. So what is a biliary atresia to a physician and a surgeon? The physician says, my job is done, this is yours. And after the Kasai is done, the surgeon says, my job is done, back to you now for the, pro for the portal hypertension and all the complications. And this partnership brings a good outcome to the patient. But what really is mind boggling is when it is not biliary atresia, we are uncomfortable, we think it is, but we, it is not. So we ask that one fundamental question, did I miss biliary atresia? And all the algorithms actually start from there, the crux of all algorithms. This is the consensus report on neonatal cholestasis syndrome, which came 20 years, 22 years ago in the Indian pediatrics. And we've been following that uh, very religiously uh, in uh, all the uh, tertiary care centers, as well as the uh, uh, referral centers. And in that you give vitamin K, refer to the patient, classify as sick and non-sick. If it is non-sick, if it is pale stools, you go ahead and investigate for biliary atresia. This is what we knew till then, have things changed. There afterwards, this is that yellow alert campaign and Professor Yacha spearheaded the same. And with this, there was a dent to the referral, uh, early referrals, uh, better referrals in uh, UP at least. And, uh, but there afterwards, again, it's take a, taken a setback. And in 2020 with the COVID, we had a lot of delayed referrals. What has changed in the last 10 years? Screening has changed, diagnosis, there are new entities, diversification, there are clarities in the natural history and outcome and therapies, all because of genomics, metabolics and basic sciences, many things have changed. So we'll just highlight a few things on screening purposes. Here is a concept of integrated stool color card from our own center. And this was published in Indian Journal of Gastroenterology. Here, what we've done is we've taken the urine color. We asked the parent to see, is it high colored or normal? And there afterwards to look at the stool color, grade it as pale or pigmented. And if you notice from the previous Taiwan card, which we used to use for stool color, there's a seventh color that has been added, which was not classified there. And that was a pigmented uh, card. And in this research, we also found that parents and fellows had the best correlation because probably those two were very dedicated for the survival of the child. But when we saw parents with the um, nursing staff or maybe with the technicians or anybody who's not medical, then the correlation was not that great. But this needs further validation and possibly we need to bring it to the grassroots level, level and integrate it there. This is a Sanjeev Harpavat study in USA, Texas, where they are actually looking at all neonates being born and their direct bilirubin level. And they're saying that even if you don't have the total bilirubin high, but you have the direct component, which is higher than the total bilirubin uh, in a ratio that is higher, then this child might end up with biliary atresia. This was the first part of the study. And the second part of the study, they took all these patients, they screened about one lakh uh, uh, infants, they followed up and they found those patients with biliary atresia they could identify earlier and the reduction by the cyporterostomy was by 19 days and they found this has a better survival. Now, regarding the diagnosis of biliary atresia, we have the conventional and the unconventional. You have this typical, which I call the CRH model, where you have the clinical, which is pale stool, so radiologically, you look at the gallbladder and histologically. Add a little bit of scintigraphy probably to the same, and the patient, if everything goes right, will end up with a perioperative cholangiography. This is a standard, comfortable, and we are all prepared for a cosipotrostomy. Now, new things are coming up. People are talking about lab cholangiography. You don't want a scar. People are talking about percutaneous radiological cholangiography and contrast-enhanced ultrasound, which are novel and exciting, but they need more literature for us to be really, really convinced. 
Then you have the ERCP, MRCP, elastography, and the scoring system and biomarkers. These are risky. They have fallacies and they are not foolproof at this point of time. Nothing new in this ultrasonography. You all know uh, these are the signs that are there in, in an ultrasound. But if you take a single or a multiple parameter and keep combining with so many parameters, the best you can actually achieve is only up to 85%. That is what a meta analysis is saying. If you look at scintigraphy, scintigraphy excretory hydra excludes biliary atresia. Not very helpful when you have an obviously pale stool. And it is best done in those patients who have ambiguity. The sensitivity reported is 99%, specificity is 70%, but uh, this is from a meta analysis. And they prefer medbofenin over disofenin because the hepatocyte uptake is better. But you have to be cautious. We all know that there may be urinary contaminations. There may be inadequate labeling of the radioisotope. And so people are now, instead of diagnostic, people are saying, can it be a screening test more than diagnostic? Histopathology, the presence of steatosis and a glycogen-filled hepatocyte obviously rules out biliary atresia. If you have paucity, again, it rules out biliary atresia. If your portal tract and you're not seeing the changes in the portal tract, it again probably rules out biliary atresia. But again, histopathology is only 88 to 90 percent, not more than that. This is our own study from here many years back where we looked at and that the our patients of biliary atresia versus non-biliary atresia. And finally, we saw that the sensitivity and specificity is only about 88%. And that is almost universal for other disease or uh, other uh, studies as well. And this is the meta-analysis that came in 2016, which said for all ages, the best you can do is 93%. But if you look at patients who are less than 60 days, maybe in that subgroup, the diagnostic accuracy is a little higher. So what we want is uh, that we should not subject a patient unnecessarily for a POC. And this is just a very rudimentary data from our institute. And if you look at the 221 cases operated between 2006 and 17, that is 20 cases per year, we've had patent uh, on a POC, we've had a patent duct only in 1.3 cases per year. So that's a very, very good number. And the liver biopsy accuracy is about 94% in our um, setup. To me, there is a limited role of liver biopsy now in uh, neonatal cholestasis. And the current indications, I'll tell you, I feel is suspected biliary atresia where you are really suspecting but has a good sized gallbladder. Prior to biliary diversion, if you have a PFIC to rule out cirrhosis, persistent organomegaly despite jaundice, so you might end up with a storage disease or a congenital hepatic fibrosis or something like that. Indeterminate causes where you're not finding anything. Suspected CMV hepatitis in our scenario, which is very, very rare, but you may want to look for an inclusion body. And if your tyrosinemia has ended up with a liver SOL, then for ruling out a hepatocellular carcinoma, this is where a liver biopsy is probably required. Preferentially, we can avoid liver biopsy in atletic gallbladders and cyst of the porta because obviously this patient will require a POC. So why go through a liver biopsy pathway? Ultrasound-guided percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography. Here, the technical success rate is about 80%. And what they give is they do a pre, they give a pre-procedural antibiotic. They pre-fill the gallbladder with saline. They take out whatever bile is there and fill it with saline. They put a non-ionic contrast. And in this particular study, which has come from Korea, they said there is no cholangitis, no peritonitis. And uh, they've only done when the gallbladder lumen is visible and about 1.5 centimeters long. Uh, this is a, a data that is from ILBS Delhi and they've uh, given me this to uh, kindly lent it to me. And uh, they have 13 patients who underwent PTCC, one had a failed cannulation, 12 successful, seven had a patent system. So they said we saved POC in, in 58%. Five with an obstructed system, Three of them were confirmed to be biliary atresia, one progressed for a transplant, and one unusually ended up being sclerosing cholangitis. So POC is also not 100%. Contrast enhanced ultrasonography with PTCC, this is also a very encouraging method. Now what they're doing is instead of subjecting the patient under fluoro, they are taking out the whatever is there in the gallbladder, pushing some micro bubbles and agitated saline, just like we do our 
saline echoes for mi microbubble echoes for uh, hepatopulmonary symptom exactly like that they put microbubbles inside then they see how much of it is flowing serologically into the duodenum remember they are not using fluoro so they are not going to give radiation but this is 100% observer dependent and there may be chances that we may go wrong in this particular scenario but what they are also doing is during this procedure only they are doing the liver biopsy just to confirm that yes this was what we saw now comes the laparoscopic cholangiography this i think is a very upcoming modality and uh, this is to avoid scar lesser time for your poc lesser post operative burden and this is a study from china which has uh, looked at uh, uh, this particular entity a lot of cases and biliary OTC was 70% of their cases. There was technical success in 85%. And, the, uh, and their definition of technical failure is when they have not been able to see the gallbladder or cannulate the gallbladder or put the cannula in the gallbladder. The procedure time was significantly reduced. Uh, this is another study where they said, if you use HIDA and you use the PTCC and the liver biopsy, can you actually do away with uh, uh, the unnecessary laparotomy. So they did about 46 of these cases, 41 of the patients also had a liver biopsy. Again, technical success is only 83%. The negative laparotomy rate here was 17%. And the complications in this particular uh, study, which is more of a realistic picture, the complications was 9% patients. Some patients had bleeding fever or desaturation during the time of PTCC. This is another way of looking at the same thing in a different way. They are saying don't cannulate the gallbladder, but you look at the liver surface by laparoscopy. If your liver surface is showing uh, spider-like telangiectasia, chances of you having biliary atresia are going to be very, very high. It's how people earlier used to look at hepatic subcapsular flow on the ultrasound. And they said that is probably much better than doing a lap-assisted cholangiogram. This was a, a, a group of Egyptians who came up with a very nice article in Journal of Hepatology and where they found a scoring system, diagnostic scoring system, but was highly criticized because it does not really our, uh, follow the algorithm. So these are basically very scoring systems. They are old wine in new bottles. Nothing is popular. Still, POC is the gold standard. Another similar paper came in a pathological scoring system for biliary That also was not very helpful. ERCP, um, there was a era in 2010, probably till 15, I don't know, where ERCP was being promoted, but there was a lot of uh, issues in the same. It was uh, cumbersome, there was lack of expertise uh, in various centers. Uh, we've also tried, I think Dr. Podar will be able to give you a better perspective of this ERCP. Uh, uh, they were, it was deemed invasive and Finally, cannulation failure rates, they said, was about 13% here. MR cholangiography for biliary atresia, I don't know whether it's a very good modality or not. If you have a dilated system, then yes, that's the best because you might be dealing with a cholidocal cyst. Uh, so there's nothing there. But for biliary atresia per se, there is a study that has looked at it uh, and they have said that the complete visibility of the extrapatic bile is only 60%. And possibly the reasons for the same that is there is that we are looking at a T2-weighted image and a T2-weighted image really requires the liquid to flow. If it is an obstructed system and the liquid is not flowing in an atretic system, you're not going to pick up those signal intensity, intense intensities. So it's an absent bile flow in a typically non dilutability system. That is why the performance is probably poor and you should not be misled. Elastography is upcoming and uh, uh, better performed than a grayscale ultrasound, they say, and patients with 30 days are better candidates because they have more of fibrosis, so you can pick these cases up better. Metal, matrix metallopeptide 7, this is increasingly becoming popular. They are saying we can replace liver biopsy with the same, and uh, they, it is probably even more sensitive than the GGT. Uh, this is a study that came in Journal of Pediatrics, uh, very ambitious, and they have said that the MMP7 probably in the years to come can replace the biopsy because both MMP7 and biopsy have an accuracy of 88 to 90%. There is a subsequent study now from Japan also 
but I didn't quote that study. MicroRNA profiling, biliary HTC, I am not qualified to talk about the same. Uh, I know very little, but every year there is a new microRNA that is coming out. Which one is the best? I don't know. It's still not clear. It's in evolution. So let us look at the diagnostics performance summary. MRCP is at 60% at best, ERCP is at 80%, ultrasound 85, histology at 90, and scintigraphy at 98. Gold standard is POC, POC stands tall, like Bahubali, nobody can, it's invincible. And in the race are this PTCC and lab cholangiography, which is at 83 to 85, elastography, which is at about 85, and MMP7, which is upcoming is probably at 88. But these are all new modalities, uh, I don't know how much we should take it into the algorithms or not. It's important to remember that a sick neonatal cholestasis is not always a metabolic etiology. In fact, our experience, lots of our biliary atresias come in sick, and that is about 6% of all our biliary atresias, they come in sick. And in that scenario, it becomes a very difficult scenario because we wait, we want the, we are not sure, we want the stool color to change from pale to pigmented. You need repeated ultrasonography because, because of the sepsis, you can have a, a non-functioning gallbladder. So you're not knowing whether that gallbladder is really contractile or not. And uh, HIDA scan can be used. We defer liver biopsy till the complications settle down. But time runs out for surgery in this particular sick biliary atresias. Inspissated bile duct syndrome is the setting of hemolysis with multiple blood transfusion. They have a stormy course and they've had the, maybe some surgeries done and gone through a very bad time. And this is a, a group of six patients. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't put the reference. Uh, this is a group of six patients who, un, who had infiltrated bile duct syndrome. They had a technical success of cannulating this bile duct in only six of the patients. All had dilated duct with sludge. It was a non-excretory hyda in most of them. And they left the catheter inside the gallbladder for about 26 days with multiple flushing. And in follow-up, almost all resolved except that one ended up as a cholidocal cyst. So that means there is a gray zone here as well. Now, this is just for your knowledge, but I will tell you how genetics is helping a surgeon as well. It helps us more as a physician. The settings for genetics, which you might not come across, is a patient who's had pruritus steatoria, low GGT. And when I say low GGT, I mean low because one third of biliary atresia, it has been shown to have normal GGT. If you have stigmata of metabolic liver disease, abnormal metabolic profile, or you have extrahepatic manifestations except uh, biliary atresia splenic malformation. If you've had a neonatal liver failure, an uncorrectable INR, early decompensation, ascites, you would refer this case obviously to the physician. And the crux here is to end up with a genetic diagnosis. What is available to us presently in India a single confirmatory gene testing. That is, you know what the disease is like galactosemia or tyrosinemia, and you just go ahead and test one particular gene of the same. So you can do it in a, if the index is known and you're doing, going to do it in the SID. The second, which is much more popular is the clinical exome sequencing. That means you take a certain phenotype like pruritus, tetoria, dysmorphism, and you restrict to a panel of 20 to 30 common disorders. And then when you run out of both, then you ask for a whole exome sequencing where it is just shooting an arrow in the dark, where they test for a lot of diseases and you might end up with something. But there are chances that you may have variation of unknown significance in this particular this disorder. This is something we reported. Uh, this is an HNF1 beta mutation. This is a child who has had SIB deaths and the first SIB in this uh, uh, family was operated in PGI Chandigarh. And this was a type three biliary atresia. Uh, who are we to question? And that, that, that case, uh, the Kasai portrait failed. So this particular disorder mimics very much like biliary atresia. You may have a POC that is showing a non-visualized system and you end up doing Kasai and it might not work out. So when the second SIP came, we saw that there was dysmorphism. And when we sent the genetics, it turned out to be a HNF1 beta mutation. This may be familiar. They have syndromic faces, they have renal hypoplasia, and they may have maturity onset diabetes if they survive. This is also a very interesting case. This is a child operated here. 
and uh, it was a, a POC that did not show the duct. And uh, later in follow up, there is progressive pruritus, ichthyosis, dental anomalies, hair changes, and this child is having niche syndrome, which is neonatal ichthyosis, closing cholangitis, and hypotrichosis. So again, POC is not 100%. There are still fallacies with the POC. Here, I will show you a very difficult case, a case of dilemma. This is a child with cholestasis from day one, pale meconium, ultrasound showing triangular cord, uh, cord sign. There is no doubt this is going to be biliary atresia. And he was operated, found to have a type two, type three biliary atresia. Discharge on day 15, everything good, successful portentrostomy, done here. Two years down the line, he is anectric, but his GGT is rising. And here he is complaining of pruritus. Now, when he is complaining of pruritus, we know a certain very small group of patients of biliary atresia can have pruritus. So we tried to tell the patient that, yes, it is possible that biliary atresia can have pruritus on follow-up. But that was not the problem. The problem is the mother is PhD in genetics. And she has done a thorough research. She is questioning the doctor and the surgeon. And the surgeon here is Dr. Richa. And ma'am was 100% sure that this is a biliary atresia. I'm not, we've 100% we've sure. But she is questioning, did you really, was it really biliary atresia? Did you operate on an allergy syndrome? And we are thinking, could the mother be right? How do we disprove? And here, whether a genetic study is logical or not. And worse, she's read this article where there is a cassipontoristostomy in allegedly syndrome and where allegedly's has found has been found to have a worse outcome. So this is a very, very worried mother and we have to desperately disprove. So we did, and uh, there is some case report of an intrahepatic polystasis PFIC type three also that's associated with biliary atresia. So finally, nothing doing, we had to ask for a clinical exome sequencing and it was normal. So then she was convinced that this child is really biliary atresia who has a complication as pruritus in the, in the follow-up. And uh, how we managed is probably not a part of this uh, 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 talk today, but we didn't find any response with rifampicin and uh, it was potentially becoming hepatotoxic. Uh, finally, we were thinking biliary diversion in this situation is not an option. So what do we do next? Will he head to a liver transplant or will, shall we try new drugs? Uh, patient has moved to Delhi, so I can't tell you much more about this. So finally, my algorithm, if you have a stool color, I'm not going to give much importance to the GGT. You do an ultrasound, there's a cyst at the porta or it's an atretic GP, definitely POC, why not? If you have a good size gallbladder histology, if it is biliary atresia, again POC. If it is ambiguous, to the best of my understanding, it should be a POC, but a pe people are moving through a different pathway where they do a HIDA scan maybe, and they do lap angiography or a PTCC. If they find it obstructed, then only subject the patient to a POC. And if you have a patent system, obviously you're going to refer it to the physician. If you have a dilated system with a good, good, good gallbladder, you do an MRCP. If it's a colloidal cyst, again, the surgeon's choice. If it's a dilated system with a sludge and the setting is for inspissated bile duct syndrome, then again, POC will be required and you may need to flush the biliary system. So what is the physician's domain? What is the surgeon's domain? So surgeon's domain is where there is a persistently pale stool, urgently rule out biliary atresia and colloidal cyst. If everything is normal, refer the case to us. And for us, if you have a pale stool with any of these family history and low GGT, pruritus, early decompensation, failure, neonatal liver failure, or if you have a pigmented stool, after multiple steps, we may end up with genetics, but there are some exceptions where if you have an improving LFT and it's a idiopathic neonatal hepatitis, you don't need it there. If you've diagnosed galactosemia with an enzyme acid, again, you don't need it there. Neonatal hemochromatosis, no role of genetics and infectious diseases like HSV and very, very rarely, very rarely CMV. Thank you very much. And I'd like